No, I know. Okay, I think we'll begin. Do I need this? Good morning. <coughs> Hope everyone had a wonderful few days break and you're all terribly excited to be back. Um, so it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce my colleague, Nicole Dombrowski, uh, who's a professor of modern European and French history at Towson University. She's also the curator and digital archival coordinator of the Nuremberg papers that reside at Towson University and has become really interested and engaged in digitizing various collections um, of material so they become available to students and researchers around the world online. Um, I think the best thing that I want to say <laughs> is that Nicole is a chevalier, she's a knight. Um, the knight in the order of the Knights of the Black Olive Tree, which is a medieval, it's medieval, right? Medieval uh, guild? <laughs> yeah, it, it's a guild, right? It is a guild. Yeah. Um, she was inducted on January 16, 2011, for recognition of ongoing contributions to the history and contemporary value of olive agriculture. Um, uh, I mean, my, a minor thing is that she wrote a, a very, <laughs> two very renowned books. The, the most recent one is called France Under Fire, German Invasion, Civilian Flight, and Family Survival During World War II. And the second one, um, which is a collected, a uh, series of collected essays, um, that's now, I think it's in third printing, um, Women in War in the 20th Century, Enlisted with or Without Consent, and that was from 1999. Um, so I wish you would help me welcome my colleague, Nicole Dombrowski, to Hofstra University. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, everybody who organized this. This is my third time at Hofstra, and I am always um, uh, amazed at what a beautiful arboretum. So uh, I wonder who breaks all these leaves. Um, all right, well, uh, thank you for inviting me today. I'd like to just start by asking you, how many of you are farmers or have uh, worked on a farm or at least spent any time on a farm uh, in your young lives? So raise your hand. So how about you? Where, where have you been a farmer? In the red cap and then in the, in the kind of um, here. My dad owned a farm in Delaware, um, he's been like the past now, like the families and stuff, so I spent like some time there during the summer and stuff like that. Okay, so today's talk would be a model for how you could do your own family history, and what about you? My dad is a farmer, he grows trees, and I was a farmer for years. Oh, so you're going to have lots to say um, at the end. How many of you eat olives? Has anybody here had an olive? Um, in a martini? No, they're not. Uh, right. Okay. Um, all right. Well, so um, today I'm going to talk to you about farming around uh, the First World War. I'm going to talk to you about food. Um, I'm going to talk to you about why doing uh, the history of farming and agriculture and why farmers matter so deeply, but particularly in the context of war. Um, and I'm going to do that through talking about this small olive farm, um, which is pictured here. Um, in Neils, and I'll, I'll get to that, its location, in a minute, but I do have some introductory comments um, for why we should think about this. Notable historians of the last quarter century agreed that Germany lost the war at home before and if ever it lost it on the battlefield. A major battle in the home front defeated, uh, in the home front defeat occurred in the bread lines and at the family table in most German cities, where rationing had begun already in the fall of 1914. By 1916, neighborhoods in many German cities were in open revolt. And by 1918, 700,000 German civilians, children and women mostly, died of hunger and malnutrition. Not from bullet wounds, not from gas attacks. They died because of a failure in the German agricultural system, and in the way food is distributed. Um, so I just want to start with a couple. Uh, my slide collection is maybe not in the best order. Um, this is a map of Europe in 1918. Uh, and 1918 was one of 
the years along with 1952 of the two greatest famine years uh, in the 20th century, 1928 also uh, was a famine year. And this include Map of Europe that was printed in the New York Times um, in part to give U.S. Uh, people who were contributing money to food drives and, and to pay for food in Europe uh, at the end of the war. And this was also the year of the international uh, flu, uh, where the majority of people nation, uh, globally in 1918 died from the flu. Um, and what you can see here, uh, very briefly, I don't have a pointer, so I'm going to go in front of the thing, uh, is that in the black areas in Russia, uh, in the Baltic Peninsula, and this map is actually inaccurate. Um, recent, um, recent research shows that uh, the Middle East, along this portion, should be black as well. Uh, people were dying of hunger in the millions from 19, essentially uh, 1918 to 1919 until the economies were stabilized again. Germany, interestingly, according to this key in 1918, conveniently because they had lost the war and because we were trying to pressure them into signing the Versailles Peace Treaty um, during this period, uh, the New York Times reported no information on Germany. Sorry, we don't know. Uh, but the Germans were actually starving uh, in massive uh, numbers during 1918. But here this map shows them, oh, we don't know, so we can't be so sad about it. Um, the French and Spain, which was not a belligerent, uh, and Great Britain are shown as being food secure. That is, that food was getting to people, and they were making at least 1,200 calories a day. I don't know how many calories you eat. Typically, it's what, uh, 2,100 calories a day we should be eating? All right, so anyway, um, by the end of the war then, my thesis, one of the things that I think you have to remember, is that most people in Europe were either very hungry on a daily basis, or they were starving to death. And that is, um, so then that provides the question of why were the French, uh, the British, and I'm not going to deal with the Spanish, um, what did they do right? How did they get food during wartime, the growing of food, the distribution of food, and ensuring the food supply throughout four years of war? They didn't know war was going to be four years long, uh, but somehow the structures, the economies uh, were in place so that France and Great Britain could continue to eat, both feed the home front and avoid open revolt and revolution, which is what broke out of Germany and Russia uh, in 1918, almost as a consequence of the failure of the home front. How was France, Germany, um, I don't want to deal with Spain so much, uh, Italy to a lesser degree, able to keep their populations fed at home and at the front? In Germany, the soldiers were being fed, but not the home front population. Uh, so that matters. All right, um, so what might account uh, for the fact that the French manage their agricultural sector well? Uh, for example, bread rationing and ration cards were not introduced until June of 1918. That's four months before the war ends. Uh, so that's, that's a remarkable success story that people didn't even have to stand in lines to get uh, their daily supply of, uh, supply of bread. Now, to be fair, uh, part of this story is not just about a strong farming sector that I'm going to recount to you and talk about today and how it matters economically. Uh, part of the German problem in particular, but not the Russian problem, uh, was that the British launched a blockade beginning in the fall of 1914 and cut off all imports to Germany uh, throughout the war. And the Germans had been about 30% dependent on food imports prior to the war. So that meant their beef uh, that was coming from Argentina and the United States uh, in large part, that meant their wheat, uh, that they were not able to grow themselves and had been prior to the belligerency, been importing from Russia. Um, well, that was cut off uh, for, for reasons of, uh, of the war. So the Germans were basically feeding themselves. They continued imports from Denmark. Uh, they, they had uh, imports from uh, uh, Norway and from Sweden, um, and then from the Russian Empire after they defeated, or after the Russians uh, capitulated in March of 19. By contrast, and this is also important, the French imported 60% of all their proteins from abroad throughout the entire four years. Um, and that becomes difficult once su submarine warfare gets started uh, and really picks up after 1916 because the subs were sinking merchant marines in, in the thousands that were coming from Argentina and the United States, bringing France grain uh, and meat and sugar from the Caribbean. 
Um, but to a large extent, um, the French continued to rely on imports, but it also had a strong internal agricultural sector. All right, so my talk today, um, let me go back to uh, this beautiful image. Um, my talk today is a small part of, this much, uh, of a much larger project that tells the history of one French olive farm located in Nyons. Uh, this is the city of Nyons. This is the farm that we're going to talk about today. Uh, these are the olive groves as you would see them today in the bottom in the silver. In the top, that's mountain trees. Um, this is the village uh, from a postcard in 1918 uh, of Nyons. You can see it's pretty tiny, and the, and the mountain just uh, looms in the background. Um, this farm is located in what would be called the kind of the pre-Alps region of southern France, so it's Mediterranean. Uh, it is alpine because it's high in altitude. It's the northernmost part in which any olives will grow uh, in Europe. So it's really the limit of where you can kind of safely uh, grow olives before it gets too cold. Um, it's also important uh, to note um, that it is... Uh, for purposes um, of the future, it's very near the Swiss border. And so the, the people who live in this area, I don't know if you know this, uh, but Switzerland is one of the uh, areas of Protestant revolt uh, in Europe during the Protestant Reformation. And so the majority of these people aren't like most French people who are Catholic. They tend to be Protestant and they tend to have a very strong orientation towards Switzerland and towards Geneva. That matters in ways I'll talk about um, uh, much later. But anyway, so we're not talking about Paris, we're not talking about the wheat fields of France, which would be up in Brittany. Um, we're not talking about the milk, which would be up in Normandy. Um, instead, we're looking at this olive farm uh, in the south of France. Um, all right, so um, one of the things that I think is important for us to see uh, is how the experience of the farm and its female population and children, children's population survived the loss of manpower um, that conscription brought about during the First World War. I think it's important to see how these abstract concepts of food production, distribution, male labor shortages, female leadership impacted real people for whom the war was not a beginning uh, nor an end, but a significant part in the life history of this farm and in this culture. It also is a story, I would argue, um, my farm story, uh, it brings us to a significant juncture that shows how um, family farming changed uh, during the war uh, and then in the long run, um, during a period of near complete global uh, political collapse and economic collapse. All right, um, I've chosen the concept of resilience, um, not to celebrate not to venerate the women and children and newly admitted immigrant laborers who helped, you know, close the gap in man shortage because all the men went to the front. Um, but rather I chose on resilience because for my story, for one family and many others, their unit, that family unit, endured the war, which in and of itself was a success. And in odd ways, the war transformed farming in France for the better. Um, not necessarily in the short term, uh, but as we will see uh, for the long term. Indeed, the war had unintended consequences uh, for millions of people. Um, and we could think about non-resilient counterparts to this story. So one thing of doing history and looking at success is also to think, oh, well, what's the way open to look at how other family farms failed? Um, why did this farm survive uh, where others failed? We can better understand why very capable good farms and good farm families um, in Germany and in France also failed. All right, um, this is, I just, um, I'm gonna move forward from this. Uh, this is an image, it's a lithograph um, that was done in Germany uh, and circulated in 1918 by Kaiser Kalowitz, who some of you might know is a famous German artist. Um, her work focused entirely during the war on the starvation that was taking place. On, uh, on the home front. And you can see this mother who's supposed to be breastfeeding her child, who is nothing but skin and bones, and the child is nothing uh, but skin and bones. And I think we should keep that image in our mind as the alternative of the women I'm going to talk about um, who were not only on a farm and eating, um, but they were also providing food 
you know, essentially for a bra that was not started. So this is the counterpart. In Germany, by 1916, all agricultural distribution had begun to break down. Um, and French, uh, German farmers um, were living a very different story um, in Europe. Okay, let's look at, I don't know if you can see these. Um, I just want to, I think part of the story is, is looking at the French agricultural sector before the war. Um, so this, this, this slide just gives you um, France by the numbers. Um, I'm so tempted to walk away from my podium, but um, I won't do that. Um, so if we look at, comparatively speaking, before the war in 1900, uh, when the first agricultural survey uh, for the 20th century came out, 5,674,713 uh, men um, were engaged as farmers um, in the French agricultural sector. Uh, about 30% of them owned their own farm, and the rest of them were day laborers. But they had skills. They knew how to uh, plow with, uh, with uh, cattle. They knew, they knew how to you know, um, fertilize. They knew how to do the things that were necessary. At the same time, there were about, uh, in 1900, a total of uh, 2 million, so about a third, um, 2,754,000 female agricultural workers. Those were primarily in the dairy industries. They were milking. These were women whose job was to make sure that, you know, cows were milked on a regular basis. And the others are wives of farmers. And I think one of the important things to emphasize about the agricultural sector, and you don't know today your modern farm um, experiences mirror this, uh, but there wasn't the sharp gender divide um, in terms of labor in the rural areas that there were in the urban areas. So these women, um, who were engaged in agricultural work, or even were quote wise. They were out in the fields sometimes. They were they were part. They knew what to do. And I think that that's a very important uh, aspect of the survival of the agricultural sector during this period. Um, in when the war comes in 1913, 3,700,000 farmers are conscripted. What happens to that number? Five million. It's almost cut in half. So all of a sudden, the labor, the men who pick, the men who plow, the men who have the capacity to carry large bags of fertilizer from the wagon into the field, right? They are gone. They're hauling guns. In a second, mobilization uh, took place over a period of one week. Over a period of one week, it took place. Uh, and by the end of August uh, 1914, the majority of French farmers were mobilized on the front lines. It mattered that it was August. It mattered that it was August because in September and October, the harvest come up. And so what that meant was that the harvest of 1914 that had been growing all year risk not being collected. Now the French government was very smart in a way that the German government wasn't in 1914 because the German government thought it was going to be a really quick war and they mobilized absolutely everybody. They kept them at the front through August, uh, through September and through October. And the French realized in the second week of September, even if the war is going to be very long, we've got to bring the harvest. And they gave weekend relief and one week relief periods to men who came off the farm so they could go home and bring in the harvest and begin that transition period. That was key. That was a key kind of moment. And it meant that the state was kind of taking a hand and advancing its role in organizing the agricultural sector. And one of the things I want to argue is that that wasn't new for the French. That it mattered that the state had a long-term relationship uh, uh, with the agricultural sector. So uh, that's one issue I want to uh, I want to keep uh, in the back of our heads. For the long term, for the long term, if you go back to that number, uh, five million six hundred seventy four thousand. For the long term, six hundred seventy three thousand men never return. Those farms mostly fail. Those farms mostly fail. Those were men who were going to carry on the future of farming. Uh, and they never, and 500,000 came back and they couldn't do a thing. They had lost an arm. They had gone blind by gas. They had lost a leg, so they weren't going to be out pushing uh, a plow in the fields. 
Um, all right, just a few other numbers because we're going to go into the olive industry and how this impacted just one segment of the agricultural economy. Um, on the eve of the war, 1912, uh, there were 300,000 olive farmers in France. These are different farms uh, under different directorship. Now, the majority of those 300,000, and this is very important and interesting for the long term, is they were in Tunisia and in Algeria. They weren't on the French mainland, uh, where the farm I'm going to talk about uh, resides. So I just want to keep you um, thinking about that. Um, and then I want to just point out a few other numbers here that as a response by 1915, all of a sudden the French government said, oh, we've got all these men who are at the front. We've got these women who are behind the lines. Uh, what are we going to do? We're going to have to bring in immigrant labor. And it's the immigrant labor and the female labor that is going to close the gap. Germany was unable to bring in that kind of foreign labor workforce. And it was another one of the elements of the German equation in the agricultural sector that meant that they just couldn't uh, produce enough food. So the Germans, remember, had the blockade. Uh, they had um, the inability to import uh, labor, and they just let their men go home uh, in the first weeks of the harvest in 1914. Um, also, the French fun fact, uh, if you were a prisoner, you got released in 19... That, that already started in 1915, so they opened the prisons and they sent the prisoners, not to the front lines, because they didn't think that the prisoners would be very loyal, uh, but they thought, oh well, you know, we can send them onto the farms. So uh, the war was good for prisoners. Okay, um, French agricultural labor. Uh, so I want to emphasize the pre-war strength of France. I want to emphasize the pre-war strength of France. Um, here's one of the documents that I work with. Um, these are statistical files that were kept by the French Ministry of Agriculture and then people who were organizing associations. Uh, to look at what was going on in the agricultural sector uh, and keep statistics so that people would know. Um, so you had already um, in 1900 in this uh, publication uh, 2,754,000 women uh, who were working in forests uh, or they were working uh, in agriculture and who had professional training. Um, that meant they went to some kind of technical school in the community where they learned small amounts of farming. Uh, it could have been how to prop up a tree if, if you were in forest, it could be how to cut down a tree, but they had some agricultural knowledge. This too is absent in Germany. The gender divide is very strong between women doing domestic labor and women doing field work on the farms. And so when Germany goes to war in 1914, those kind of gender divisions, which are you know, in, somewhat, in some ways stereotypes, were hard for the Germans to overcome, where the French women had already been doing this stuff, going back and forth uh, for some time. But in 1914, the state mobilized education. And again, this is an important segment uh, of the French story, is that high schools, which would have been teaching, let's say, just math or, or uh, you know, reading or something uh, like that, turned into agricultural training schools. Uh, and these are high school girls, um, somewhere, uh, it looks to me like this would be northern France, who are going into, they're taking a course on how to learn to dig, you know, dig seeding trenches. Um, and so this was, this was something that was funded by public education. Uh, it was mass, on a mass scale. Uh, and the French were right on top of saying, we've got to get women in the fields um, as quickly as possible because uh, they have to replace um, male labor. So these are some of the, the backdrops. Here, I love this because this is pre-tractor people. World War I was still pre-tractor. Um, certainly there were automotive um, farm tools um, that were in the United States, but throughout Europe, the introduction of the tractor and automated kind of farm machines doesn't really happen until the 19, late, mid 1920s and, and in mass in the late, um, in the early 1930s. Uh, so here, this woman uh, is learning how to encourage a, a cow to go through the field and pull the plow. Um, I don't know how many of you have your own cow at home and, and have a good working relationship with your cow, but I can really get my dog to fetch the newspaper. So this was stuff that had to be learned. You had to learn how to navigate a cow through a pasture. And then to hook up, can you see there, um, the, the metal plow in the back of two women? 
uh, that would have been the work of one man. And it takes three women to do the work of one man right there. Um, so you're, you're seeing uh, what a kind of um, uh, deficit of labor uh, can mean. All right, let's go to the Brez Farm. This is a picture, a postcard picture, nonetheless, of the Brez Farm. Uh, that's the farm, the Allah farm I'm going to be talking about uh, in, uh, at the turn of the century. Um, I think one of the most uh, incredible things, if we did a, a comparison of this photo and the photo I showed you early on, uh, is that the mountain is practically bare of trees. Can anybody guess why? Now, today they have trees, uh, and, and the, picture, the earlier picture had trees. Can you guess why the mountain is bare of trees? You've got the farm, you see the house there, the little white dot, and then above, all you see are these kind of white patches, right? And that's barren. Do you know why there are no trees? So, I'll tell you. I'm getting paid to do that. Um, the trees, the mountaintops were practically bare all across Europe at the beginning of the 19th century and into the war because the trees had been harvested for fuel in order to heat uh, people's homes and in order to create energy in factories. Well, now fuel comes from oil, it comes from coal, it comes from uh, wind, right, solar. Uh, but it's interesting to think that Europe had practically tapped its, uh, its fuel resources by the beginning of the 20th century in terms of wood and had to innovate in these new areas of oil, coal, uh, which was new then, but you know, not new to us uh, anymore, uh, because there were, they already tapped out the forest. So what you see there is deforestation. Um, and happily, I can tell you that that's come back, um, that forests are, are, are coming back to the tops of mountains. All right, so um, on the breast property then, um, this was a diverse farm, and most French farms at this time, not today, I'm not doing a comparison thing, but for the long term, they were diverse. This is a list of every single uh, patch of farmland and it is monitored by the government uh, on a five-year basis. And we can go back and we can see all of the taxes that the farmers pay every five years um, on their property, and we can see how much each patch produced. Um, and these records are part of what I'm using in my project, but they go all the way back uh, to the 16th century. Um, this is what is called the Napoleonic uh, Cadaster. So Napoleon, um, the innovation of the Napoleonic system was that it turned the measurement of all land into metric measures. Um, so that was the kind of innovation of the 19th century. So this is all metric meters uh, and ours. But anyway, this is how I can go back and I can see over a long period of time how, how the farm is increasing in production, decreasing, how people, how farmers are swapping out one patch of land uh, for a different patch of land. So uh, it's, a, it's a valuable tool that you have to learn how to read. All right, here are the people I want to talk about uh, today. This is the Breast family. Am I, can I do? I don't have a pointer. In the hat uh, is a spree Auguste Bress. Uh, he is the father. This photo is 19, about 1913. Uh, here in the photo is his eldest son who should have inherited the farm. And inheritance is a very important part of the long-term story. Uh, of stability in the agricultural sector. Uh, here is uh, August Philippe Bress. And see the cute little boy on the bottom? Isn't he cute? With his fabulous bow that he's wearing is Rene Louis Bress. He was born in 1906. And on the eve of the war, he was just, uh, he was just a little kid. He was seven years old. His two sisters, uh, the smallest one is Irene, uh, next is Yvonne, and there is the kind of hero of my story today, Marie Tortel. Know that her hair is very long, it's up in a bun. Uh, she's got what would be kind of, you know, um, I would say, what would you say, nice provincial dress that she's wearing. She's somewhat feminized. Her look is going to be transformed uh, by the war if she's going to have to take on more and more responsibility. All right, um, so this is one generation um, that I'm looking at. Um, and what I know about this family comes from their marriage contracts. This is Marie's marriage contract uh, to Auguste. Um, and let me just read you a little bit of it because I don't think uh, you all read French. 
They were married in 1896 by a dotal contract. Um, and that means that she had to bring a dowry uh, to the contractual obligation of the marriage. Um, in her contract, which was signed um, in, uh, in the Alps, she was from a town in the Alps, and I think that matters, and I'll tell you how later, um, she handed over to the Breast family 400 francs, uh, which could buy you um, about a cap in, 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 um, in the period in which uh, she was married. 400 francs were the personal assets, mostly linens, 400 francs in cash, 800 um, francs that she had inherited from her grandfather, 2,300 francs inherited from her other grandfather, and 700 francs inherited from her, uh, from her mother because her parents were both dead. Uh, so she brought a rather large sum uh, the total that was transferred at the signing of the contract was $2,700. So she enters the marriage as an investor. Think of her as an investor. And when the war comes and the men leave the farm, what could she lose? She could lose her investment. And I think this matters that French women have a financial investment in their land holdings. And this is not true as you go further east in Europe. They weren't co-proprietary, co-property owners. But here they had an investment, and if we go down, Esprit Abus, the man she's marrying, he has to match that investment. Uh, and they all bring the money to the table that's going to be the very minimum that they need in order to start the farm. So I'm arguing that these investments, these marital contracts, um, that in France were somewhat more, uh, I would say, egalitarian based on men and women, uh, mattered deeply. Now here's somebody else uh, that I want to introduce to the story. Uh, this is Albert Laurent Reno. He lived further down the mountain. He was also mobilized in 1914. Um, he had a much smaller farm, and he fell in love. He fell in love in February of 1914. And we know that his relationship was consummated before August when he was mobilized because the woman that he had a illicit affair with, um, Helen, we call her, because that's her name, uh, she had a baby. Here's Helen. Uh, I'm gonna, here's Helen. And here's the baby from the illicit affair. Um, Helen did not have a dowry. Her mother ran a cafe in Lyons. Her mother was an unwed mother. And that was called a fee mama. And it was almost as bad as being a prostitute. So she had a low social standing. That's Helen's mother had a low social standing. Helen met Al Albert, who we just met, at a cafe. And they produced that little girl down there with a fox on her lap, Odette. <coughs> Albert and Elen asked Albert's parents if they could get married in July of 1914, before he was able to leave to the front. And his parents said no. And so they went to the town over, and they got married secretly. When Albert comes home from the front, in 1918, and he's demobilized his parents said, you know, we have a present for you. You get off at the town before Neons, and we'll come pick you up, and then you can come back. They literally kidnapped him, did bring him back to Neons, and forced him to sign divorce papers, divorcing a lead. Why? Because she couldn't bring a dowry to the marriage. She couldn't invest in the farm. And so I think it's interesting to think about the farm sector not just organized in terms of business, but also in terms of effective relationships. So what happens is they find this cousin, Cammy. He's Albert's cousin. He doesn't have a farm. And so they say, okay, well, if you agree to the divorce, Helen, if you agree to divorce, um, then we'll marry you to Cammy, and that way you won't have an illegitimate child. And so in a very strange way, this little girl Odette with the box on her lap is legitimated 
uh, by the marriage of Helen uh, to um, Camille. But she, she, she doesn't have any property at that moment, but, but I want you to follow this thread. So farmers on the eve of the war were very concerned about what we would call these shotgun marriages in the agricultural sector. Because what that meant potentially is that if their son went off to war and was not capable of coming back, that some girl without a dowry uh, might inherit this farm. And that seemed destabilizing. So marriage became very, I would argue, politicized, very controlled, almost reversing back to kind of pre-arranged marriages in the early 19th century. And these contracts became a way of French farm parents to ensure and stabilize the continuation of their farm. So on the one hand, these contracts were good in that women invested in the farms and they had a return. And on the other hand, these contracts were bad because it meant that there was a less, less freedom of French farm women to marry who they wanted and less freedom for French farm men to marry who they wanted. All right, so I think that the marriage system complicated, even rigid, created a stable structure for French agriculture throughout the war. And it stabilized financially French farms in ways that were not uh, similar in Europe. Here's Meme, uh, here's, here's the cafe owner woman uh, holding her great-grandchild in 1959. Uh, so she doesn't care what they call her. Uh, she kind of won. Here's Odette uh, with her fox on her lap. Okay, so one of the parts of my argument is that marriage mattered. It mattered in important ways in stabilizing the individual farms in the agricultural sector, and I've just given you uh, one example. Uh, another way that it was the French sector was uh, stabilized was by a law of 1884. And here again, I'm playing with chronology. We can't just look at the war. We have to look at what happened before the war. Why was France a more stable agricultural environment? And in 1884, one of the important things that happened is that the government said that farmers could create farmer unions. They would have the freedom of assembly and the freedom of association to form political unions called syndicates that could lobby the government uh, and control prices and control production on behalf of their particular sector. In olives, in France, olives was not as organized uh, as vines, but these sectors, these, uh, these free association sectors became very important in offering um, technological education to farmers. They demanded and lobbied the government so that farmers could receive subsidies in order to buy fertilizer. They negotiated in ways that we would call fixing prices. Uh, they negotiated the price for which olives would be sold, or wine, which was a much more, um, um, a much more syndicated uh, agricultural sector than, than olives. Um, and very importantly, uh, they began to provide pensions and investment banks called mutualité for their members. So this was members only. Um, but what it meant um, was that there was a democratic organization of farmers based on interest and sector that allowed them to get from the government what they needed, but also allowed to control market prices. So this isn't free market capitalism. This isn't like one farmer outbidding or underselling the next farmer. Um, this is associationalism. And this was extremely strong in France by 1914. And what it meant is that going into the war, French farmers in wheat, these associations existed in wheat growing, they existed in, uh, they existed in uh, the olive sector, and they existed in the wine sector. It meant that they could come together as a powerful unit and lobby for their interests and also acquire technology. In the Russian sector that was black on the humper map that we looked at, there was no political freedom prior to the revolution in 1917 for Russian farmers to organize. In fact, Russian farming was concentrated in the hands of the nobility in Russia 
prior to the revolution. There had only been a small selling off of land that took place in Russia after 1863, which is around our U.S. Civil War. But mostly, uh, so there was no, what I would call, dynamic component to the Russian agricultural economy. And I think that matters, that there's a dynamic component, there's dynamic buy-in by women in France, there's dynamic buy-in between farmers and the state, and that dynamic buy-in that creates associations, it, it has political organizational uh, consequences for democracy. It meant that French farmers were fighting on the front lines for democracy. They were fighting for the independent property owner. They were fighting for their own private capitalist interests in the sense that they were small capitalists with a small seat. Whereas the German farmers were still on a kind of agricultural uh, system that was between the Russian Empire, which was practically feudal. Um, the farms in Germany were much larger than the French farms. Um, the average French farm was around 10 hectares, 10 hectare acres. Um, the average German farm was around 50 hectare acres. Um, and so one person owned the land, but mostly it was a day laborer who was making nothing, if, if not earning his own soup. Uh, at the end of the day. So there wasn't that dynamic investment in German agriculture. So when German men went to the front, they asked who were they fighting for? Who, they, who were they dying for? Whereas when the French men went to the front, they were fighting for their own farms. They were fighting for their land and their territory. And every incursion into French territory that happened from 1914 to 1915 was the incursion onto somebody's farm, somebody's personal livelihood. So it was a much more personal buy-in. And what I'm saying, is that agriculture had political as well as military consequences in that way. So that's dynamic investment, uh, dynamic buying. And that comes out of this experience of associationism uh, that's so important. Uh, the French Empire had buy whereas the German Empire didn't. And the olive sector is so important in showing the way in which uh, agricultural uh, farmers in Algeria and North Africa and in Tunisia who were semi-colonial subjects, to be sure. They didn't have the same freedoms, they didn't have the same citizenship rights as the French olive farmers who were living in the metropole, uh, which is continental France, but they still were part of this association movement. And here's an Algerian newspaper uh, from Bougie, which is located kind of right on the Mediterranean coast, um, kind of near Algiers. Um, and they are organizing, it's interesting, in 1910, what were they organizing against? Uh, they were organizing against people watering down olive oil with olive and trying to sell fraudulent olive oil. And it's out of this period. How many of you are salad eaters? Uh, if you know that olive oil is now its first pression and second pression, um, virgin olive oil, right? All of those distinctions. Those came out of this early period uh, when fraudulent olive uh, millers would add water to oil and try and sell it as pure oil and try and get a, uh, a higher volume. So uh, this is so associationalism. It spanned uh, beyond uh, France itself and into the empire. And so when Algerian farmers are recruited into the French army, as they were in 1914, and Tunisian farmers are asked to serve uh, for the colonial empire, they have a buy. They, they're not invested necessarily in full, as full citizens, but they're full property. And that matters too. So I think when we look at the agricultural se sector uh, and agricultural history, we get to see a better sense uh, of where this is. All right, um, I want to talk about weather now. Because the war wasn't just about manpower. The war didn't just happen within the context of families. The war happened within the context of the environment, the natural world. And the farmer is always at battle with the natural world. Uh, whether patterns don't conform or change or accommodate war, indeed they continue on in their own kind of uh, meteorological cyclical patterns that have been developing. By 1914, Europe was coming out of what was known as the mini ice age. Indeed, what that means is that global temperatures were warming already uh, by 1914. Um, and this we can see as a direct relationship with industrialization in some of the states um, in Northern Europe. However, the war created interesting 
meteorological changes, particularly in the north, that didn't affect southern France as much, but I think they're worth mentioning. The clouds of shrapnel and the smoke caused by gas attacks and caused um, and, and by the use of explosives on massive scales in the north created false what were called rain clouds over the over the they, they weren't rain they were gas clouds they weren't the kind of mustard gas but they were clouds that blocked out the sun in the north and had a direct impact on the failure of crops at the end of 1914 and throughout 1915 because the sun could not shine through. And so the growing season was, I would say shortened, but it was uh, interfered with throughout the spring and throughout the summer because the sun, some areas were so dense and thick and black and smoke, and if you want to know what this looks like, turn on your TV and look at Northern California right now which is going to have a long-term consequence in terms of trying to go back from this fire. But there are areas in California now where people, the sun isn't necessarily uh, coming through because the clouds are so thick uh, right now in terms of blocking out the sun. So you had that kind of cloud cover artificially made, industrially manufactured, that was having an impact throughout the war uh, on food growth. In the north, not in the south. But weather was a constant variable that farmers could not uh, organize for. And I have this great quote. So one of the problems in the south um, that the Brez family had to uh, fight against was cold, freezes, and hail. Um, and as you see, um, in 1887, when Victor Bress, uh, whose father had the farm, uh, much less of the farm was in olives and more was in vines. When Esprit Auguste takes over the farm, he increases the number of olive plantations and decreases the number of, of vineyards uh, in the farm. The vines are red, the olives are green. I thought that that was a good way to organize the graph. Um, and so what does this mean? Um, this means uh, two things. One, vines withstand cold more than olives do. So he's actually, as three of goose, by planting more olive trees and being so far north, he's taking a risk because he's putting in more olive trees uh, rather than vines, and vines can uh, withstand cold. So that's a problem. Uh, the other thing by putting in more olive trees is olive trees, unlike vines, are very susceptible to hail. And in southern France, hail storms happen typically in the month of June, and they can wipe out an entire olive orchard. For reasons that I can't quite understand, vines, maybe it's because they're lower to the ground and they grow closer together, are more resilient against hail. But in the mid, uh, prior, prior, prior to the war, um, one of the things that began to happen is the creation of hail, uh, hail leagues. Um, and these hail leagues were small military units that were formed in the countryside throughout southern France, not just in the area that I'm talking about, to fight against individualism uh, and to create, quote, a unified front of action which was necessary to launch artificial clouds um, and to use uh, rockets and lightning unions against ice in what were called defense against hail leagues. These were equipped farmers with cannons, rockets, and bombs. Uh, and they used and formed anti-hail organizational units that were combat ready against natural disaster um, and which assumed a similar form of national guard coordination that would be replicated at a period of mobilization for war. So here's another way in which the organization of the agricultural sector had direct consequences uh, upon the moment in which the war was, was called. All these farmers in the South had already been firing cannons uh, they had little tiny rocket launchers, and I don't know. To, I don't know if you have this on your farms, either of you. But what the French do is they, they have iodide rockets, and they fill these uh, rocket capsules with iodide. And then when a hail cloud comes over, they fire, and there's men on, a, 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 an alarm sounds like a military warning sound. All the farmers go out to their post. And they fire rockets at the same time into the cloud. The belief is that the iodide will raise the temperature of the cloud and melt the hail in the cloud before it falls onto the fruit and damages the fruit. To this day, there is no science to say that that works. <laughs> to this day. And it's only, it's only five years ago that the French government stopped subsidizing 
the purchase of hail rockets for farmers. I just want to add that in. But what does that mean? It means these men were mobilized. They had uh, they had National Guard like units uh, in the countryside, um, and they had a kind of esprit de corps against nature um, that I would argue tra tra translates over into uh, the battle lines. I'm going to skip that. Uh, these are more land distribution uh, records. Okay, so one of the things we've seen on the Brez farm is that Marie Tortel is highly invested uh, in stabilizing her farm. Um, in August of 1914, although her husband was 40 years old, he was mobilized. Um, the toxin sounded, the country, uh, the, the farmers from the countryside came in uh, from the fields, they went down into the towns, they read the posters that gave them their mobilization orders, told, told them what uh, garrisons to report to, what to bring, and when they would leave, uh, and they departed grumbling. The kings of Europe are ready to screw us over. It says, Van Uverfut, which is the same thing in France. So this idea, interestingly, that they were being called to war to fight a war that was being uh, created by the kings of Europe um, and the monarchy. All right, well, on the Brez Mountain, high on the Vaux, perhaps the church bells of the sanctuary of Bon Secours reached Pied de Vaux, the farm. The month of August is hot meals. The farm is between harvests. The vineyards are not fully ripe for the picking. At three o'clock, some people may still have been taking a siesta. Esprit Auguste was about to turn 40. He found his hat. He walked down the mountain a 30-minute walk, and he went into the local village office. He took his Libre Militaire, which is a book that all Frenchmen carry, to note uh, their periods of military service. He had been a soldier in the Indo-Chinese War, attempting to subdue the Vietnamese under French colonial rule, and there he had gotten uh, yellow fever. He was a little bit, what we might say, um, uh, the French say touché, they also say uh, enfeebled. Um, so he wasn't very strong in his uh, rationing capacity. He thought that he was going to get uh, a health discharge. But instead he was told uh, that men from the age of 39 to 42 uh, should begin to mobilize for the month of October. This gave the Brez farm the opportunity to prepare for the mobilization of at least the leader of their family. His son, Auguste Philippe, would not turn 21 until 1917 and was able to stay on the farm uh, during the first three years of his free Auguste uh, departure. The class of 1917 uh, was mobilized for training in 1916, uh, and so instead, uh, Auguste Philippe was left, uh, left, for, left for the front lines uh, for training at the end of 1917. What that meant for the Brez family that René, age seven, was left with his mother, Marie Tortel, and the two girls to manage the entire Brez farm. René, because the family had a uh, overseer, uh, was able to continue his wartime, ex uh, his wartime education. He descended into the, uh, into the uh, village on a regular basis. Um, and he essentially became uh, the recipient of wartime pedagogical propaganda. All lessons in France had been centralized by decree law under Albert Soreau, the Minister of Education, uh, beginning in 1914. School books were quickly transformed to give lessons, be it in math or in reading, to encourage France and the French farmer in the war effort. One reading exercise that was assigned to French children recounted the, from a reprinted diary, the life of a child living during the French Revolutionary War of 1792. It read as follows. I work in the fields to replace the men who died for me. They are defending me against my enemies. I don't only pass my time in the fields in order to cultivate potatoes, but rather I become a child man, a cultivator of French homemade produce. This way, France will not have to, have to buy uh, imports from foreign countries and foreign territories. So this was a translation exercise that was given to all school children throughout France. This is in 1914. 
And imagine as a child, what does that tell you as a seven-year-old? What is your job as a seven-year-old? Your job is to continue where your father and your older brother uh, have departed. Um, this form of militarization of education, linking the agricultural sector to the military front, to create patriotism, to create a sense of French autonomy from foreign imports, was another, I argue, very important mobilizing factor in the countryside. Uh, and it was a way of transmitting the national project of war from an adult generation uh, to politicizing a childhood population. So even though René was not the head of the farm uh, during this period, uh, he becomes politicized, particularly for the French war mission. In this talk that I'm talking about today, um, we don't follow the trajectory of Renee's life, but it's important to say that when the Germans came down in 1942 and occupied the Dreads farm, uh, that Renee joined the resistance, and they were able to go into the Alps and continue to farm and feed resistance fighters. So I think that that inculcation at a very young age has what I've referred to in the beginning as long-term consequences. All right, in 1915, a great freeze uh, hit Northern Europe. This is the weather factor. And where it uh, paralyzed resources, particularly in Northern Germany, uh, in Northern Germany, in uh, the Scandinavian sector, which was feeding the German population, um, it was Southern France, the olive farm that I was talking about, uh, that was able to continue uh, and to feed the French sector, um, particularly along the line. So uh, by, uh, by the uh, end of the war, one of the things that was important in this year of freeze were wheat in particular um, and other uh, northern crops such as apples were completely destroyed. Uh, southern crops such as olives, walnuts, which became a protein substitute for meat, uh, after 1914, I'm sorry, after 1917 and into 1918, became ways in which uh, the French were able to stabilize their food supply. On the Brez farm, something interesting happened, and Mary Tortel took a very independent approach in the absence of her husband and in the absence uh, of her oldest child uh, at the end of 1917. As freeze conditions hit the north, she decided to pull up her vines. parcels of vines. That's like you going out into your backyard, your neighbor's backyard, three, maybe four backyards on your lot, and deciding to pull up all the grass without any male help. And she decided to plant African trees. While other people were fighting the war, she was fighting the earth. And in that year, she managed to plant approximately 40 apricot trees. Why apricot trees? Because she read the weather. Apricot trees and apricot blossoms and apricots freeze at a much higher temperature, at a much lower temperature than grapes and olives. And Marie Tortel reasoned she was a woman from the Alps. She was a woman who had been brought down into this Mediterranean territory. She reasoned if I plant a fruit that is going to withstand cold temperatures, I'm going to be su successful, maybe not in 1918, maybe not in, uh, in 1920. But by 1929, when the greatest freeze to hit Europe in the early part of the 20th century came and destroyed 50% of all French olive crops, the Brez farm succeeded. It had polyculture, which meant many types of crops, and it had the one kind of fruit that could sustain low temperatures uh, and still grow in the southern kind of hot climate, uh, and that was the apricots. And I'm Polish, and my friend here, uh, Professor Charnel is Polish, and I am very happy to tell you that the variety that she planted uh, in uh, 1917 was called La Polonaise, which means the fretful, beautiful Polish woman. Uh, and so, um, I want to talk about then uh, the strategies and some of the strategies uh, that helped French farmers and French women uh, uh, survive the war. Marie Tortel's son came home in 1919, uh, Philippe Auguste, and like many men who had been mobilized at the front and traveled, he got the travel bug, and he decided that he did not want to be a farmer and did not want to return to Lyon's. Oh my, the farm and its future stood in ruin. 
Her husband, who had been injured already uh, by disease in the tropics in the Indochina War, was further disease was further um, was further reduced in his capacities. Uh, and you can see him. He's got here. This is Paulus. You can barely see him. Uh, and he retreated to a veterans rehabilitation center and was not returned uh, to civil life until 1920. Uh, essentially two and a half years actually after the war's end, uh, which continued Marie's independence uh, on the farm. So it's during that time uh, that René, the boy man, uh, essentially, I'm going to skip all these, uh, René, the boy man, grew up uh, to see and help how, see his mother's ingenuity, to see uh, the kind of flexibility she had in terms of her strategies for managing the agricultural plantings on the farm. Uh, he also had no male overseers and could do essentially what he wanted um, during this period. And it would be then um, in 1930 that he would begin to take the direction of the farm. Uh, having trained under his mother, uh, he would become a lifelong, and I'm going to skip ahead, a lifelong lover uh, of apricots. Um, so, how does this story of one French farm help us understand uh, the importance of the French agricultural sector? I am tracing this over a period of 200 years. I've shared with you today just a glimpse of how the farm um, adapted uh, during the period of war. I want to stress three things. The farm survived, I think, in my humble estimation, first and foremost, because the French state had been heavily involved in managing the agricultural sector from the 1880s. Secondly, I want to argue that the association of farmers into free political unions allowed them to have a stake uh, beyond just simple kinds of cries of patriotism, but a real stake in winning the war. Their wives, through their marriage contracts, which were liberal for the time, although we would consider them somewhat constrained, gave them buying and what I call dynamic investment into the outcome of the war. And they were active participants uh, in managing their farms. But secondly, women were trained by the French state through these uh, agricultural schools, which particularly formed uh, female women from 1914 to 1918, to take up these unusual roles, which were still very masculine, extremely physically demanding, and to challenge gender boundaries and gender ideals um, at the turn, at the turn of, of the century. And then finally, I want to say um, that this kind of concept of Marie coming from an outside, uh, coming from a different sector, uh, a different region, coming from the outs, this kind of intermarriage between regions, was almost like being fertilized, fertilizing the farm from outside, bringing in different ideas, different risk factors that created a dynamic response, not only to war, but also to in increasingly um, what I would call uh, precarious weather conditions. So I'm going to leave you with that. If you have any questions, um, I'd be happy to uh, field them. Thank you very much. So we have some time for questions. Um, I have. <laughs> um, and maybe you all think of questions while I ask my, my question actually, because I love this notion of the investment, the dowry as investment, but um, how, what did that mean exactly? Like, could she own the farm? Or was it just, did she have shares in a farm? I mean, because we, in, in our women's studies class, we've been talking about property rights, and like in, in England, women didn't have property rights until the 1880s, really. Um, and, but of course, women get the vote earlier in Britain than in France. And so what, what does this investment really mean for her? Right, so that's a great question. Um, the French women, does anybody know when French women got the vote? Yeah. Uh, 1944. Exactly. So she was not a citizen, per se, during this period. Um, but French women could inherit. Um, those inheritance would have to be managed by a male tutor, was the term that was used. 
So French women could inherit, but they could uh, they would have to you know, have a male tutor. What matters um, in the stipulation of the marriage contracts is that if the marriage dissolved and divorce was made legal under Napoleon in France, if the marriage dissolved, she was allowed to take her full investment with her in cash out of the farm. She could not take land. Uh, she could not take back her linens, even if she had sold them herself. Uh, but she was obliged to be given cash. This was a great, it was a kind of tool that the French used at that time to keep people married uh, and to stabilize the agricultural sector. But it was also uh, what I think is a pretty um, advanced concept um, for women. So if the farm failed, she wasn't going to get the farm, uh, but she was going to get her investment back, which would have been the same sum that she had put in, which would have been 2700 well, by the time 1914 came around, she'd already been on the farm for over 12 years. Her investment had, you know, in terms of labor and time and in terms of management, had greatly, uh, what we would call, you know, increased. Right. She wouldn't have been able to walk away with that. So I think that um, that the investment becomes then in the land and the labor, and that you know, she has to hold on to that land because if it fails, you know, she was so that's, the that's the impulse for her to kind of figure out how to make it. Her I, I, for all women to figure out how to make it work, right? Um, so this concept of if you're if you're if you buy into a farm um, and it fails, um, and you're only going to walk away with your initial investment and you had years of labor that's unpaid. Nobody got paid. Remember, nobody got paid during this period. Farm labor was not paid. They didn't get like dividends at the end of the day. You had your land and you had what it produced over there. Um, and you as a woman, if, if the land produced 4,000 francs and you put in 2,700, you walked away with 2,700. You weren't getting anything else out of it. So I think that that was an incentive. Um, and it was not, as I said, the regime in the East. And the further we go East, look at Russia. Um, and one of the great sins of Stalinism was to destroy the family farm. That created in and of itself a kind of moral um, and I would say even emotional destruction to agriculture in the Soviet Union. That created a decade of famine. They removed, uh, by taking away the family farm, creating farming collectives and making farming just something that was industrial and, and a job you showed up to every day and you got paid $10 an hour, but you know, at the end of the day it wasn't yours, so you didn't care, um, created the, 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 the collapse of the agriculture and the food sector in the East. So I think it's, it matters in that way. I have a question. I'm sitting here thinking about uh, Luann Jones' Mama, Learn, Mama Learned Us to Work, uh, which focuses on our, uh, women in the South who during World War II uh, create this new industry just from trying to survive, right? Growing of chickens and eggs, it uh, will allow for the South to sort of boom with this poultry industry post-World War II. So I'm wondering if French women are contributing to the sort of revitalization of the produce or fruit industry post World War One in a similar way. So it's interesting that you say revitalization. Um, if we go back, the French agricultural sector collapsed in uh, the early 1870s and continued that it collapsed. It collapsed because of the phylloxera virus, which hit French vines. All French vineyards died from the period of 1872 to 1889, and they were only brought back through the importation of the American vine. Uh, which came from California. Um, yeah, it's a great, it's a great <laughs> Frank over the friendship story, right? So that sector had been, you know, completely pummeled, and during that period, people had to grow new things, but they all also had to buy California wine stuff. Um, the revival of the French sector only begins to come around then um, in around 1900. And by that time, if we look at these figures, it's very interesting. People grew melons. Um, they grew small fruits, they grew zucchinis, they grew, um, you know, little things that you could grow in your garden and then you go to the side of the, the road because what are they waiting for? They're waiting for trees and vines to come back and that can take a long time um, when you're waiting for trees and vines to come back. So what we see here is that 571,000 women were in the agricultural commerce. That's in 1900. And yes, it's important to say that women continue that trend, but it's already, as I was saying, these are all pre-war things that are already happening. It's uh, accelerated by the war, but there's already the tradition uh, of women in commerce. And they're not taking 
you know, it, the, the decline in the wine industry is something what we're going to see how Northern California is going to come back from this. Um, I think the immediate parallels are kind of interesting. Um, how much land is burning that's under vine right now, I don't think we know exactly. Um, but your wine prices are going to go up if you're drinking uh, California wine. Switch. At any <laughs> rate, um, at any rate, what's interesting is an olive tree, if it dies, and you plant it, it takes five years before it bears fruit. It takes 30 years before it turns a profit. So you're basically, with met lemons, so all these farmers, whenever these massive prices happen to, to you know, what we would call big commerce uh, items like wheat uh, or vines or, or uh, olives, you go to small, like, uh, small buying vegetables, um, and, and potatoes uh, are pretty stable and pretty resilient. So you have to change your crops. And what's so interesting about that is women tend to take care of those crops more than they do wine or uh, massive apple orchards or massive um, olive orchards, which require men to, you know, pruning is cutting off. You've got to use a saw, you've got to use, it's not electric, right? So you've got to have, we're, we're tending, um, you know, zucchinis and melons. And in the South, watermelons, I assume, you know, was a very big thing for American women. And women can carry that easily to market. You can sell, you know, a dozen zucchini on the side of the road and come back and have some money to buy something. Um, so going to market was, you know, but it's small vegetables and small fruits that stabilize um, during that period of transition. So I want to know how you sell your trees. I want to know how you sell your trees. Like what, what trees do you have and how you sell them? Is it a Christmas tree farm? No, there's hundreds of different breeds of trees, I guess, would be word. Um, but this is the world of in their own homes, and then we have a large digger that takes them up with that and the tar and then she goes on top. So you're doing the landscaping sector, right? You're uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. We mostly sell to uh, places like Home Depot and uh, like individual landscapers. Okay. How many acres? Where is this? Eastern Shore Valley. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, anyway. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So, I'm wondering about um, when you're using the ocean. Um, you know, obviously, she wasn't able to take advantage of the, the program for our agriculture for women that happened so much later. Um, so, how do you, you know, even just on the basic level, what kind of education? Did you bring to the marriage or to the to the board? So this is where being Protestant matters in this story, and I haven't talked about it in this presentation. Um, she was Protestant, and Protestants in southern France um, did home Bible reading um, in much larger numbers than Catholics. So Catholic in general um, primary school education she would have had because it was mandated by the law of 1888. So she would have gone to sixth grade. Um, but also the tradition of reading at home um, in Protestant families in the South um, dated back, and, and similar for Jewish families, um, would have dated back to the medieval period where they had to be familiar with certain at least reading the gospel. Um, so in that regard, in terms of like, literacy, that would have been her, both her formal formation would have stopped at the age of, um, at the age of sixth grade, and then her kind of reading life would have continued um, in that way. In, in the after the generation, they're all communists and they're not reading the Bible. So uh, that, that, that way of reading ends um, with her generation. But it was through apprenticeship. Um, most people were taught how to farm through apprenticeship and you know, observing what their father did. And it's going to be a great push in the 1920s um, to educate farmers as adults into how to use fertilizers and all these new chemical kinds of uh, capacities and new machines um, that are going to be just in, introduced into the agricultural sector. Um, and by that time, she's going to be much less uh, involved. But her daughter-in-law, who um, is today 105 um, years old, um, and here she is at the end of my show, uh, this is this is. This is the little girl with the fox on her lap. She's still alive. Uh, she, she's, she's 106. Um, she, too, would only 
have a, she would go to the school until she was 14. Um, and by uh, the 1920s, um, education continued the way it did during the war, not to teach farmers, you know, enthusiastic, uh, you know, patriotism, but to teach them how to graft um, so that they could graft different kinds of varieties of trees onto each other. We would teach them how to use and measure fertilizers. We would teach them how to use. So um, a kind of agricultural technical education begins in France at the primary and middle school level after the war. That's a post-war phenomenon. Um, and those the girls living in those contexts would have to live with that, as did, as did the um in the post-war period, but not the pre-war. 